coming up. Creating a machine that could destroy tower blocks like Godzilla. Crafting jackets fit for heroes. And brewing one of the world's oldest beers. How do they do it? This is the Rotar Pulverizer. A four and a half ton demolition dinosaur. When it's attached to an excavator, this 360 degree rotating head and jaws can chomp through walls for breakfast, reinforce concrete floors for lunch and steel bars for dinner. If Jurassic Park ever needs a wrecking crew, this is what they turn to. The Tyrannosaurus Rex had the most powerful bite of anything that's ever lived. But this thing has put it to shame. It's 30 times more powerful. But creating something tough enough to tackle the daddy of all demolition jobs is the mother of all engineering challenges. How do they do it? Torun in northern Poland. Founded in the 13th century, this beautiful medieval city is now a protected UNESCO World Heritage Site. But not everyone here is into preservation, because this is where some of the toughest wrecking attachments on Earth are built. This morning, designer Joris Justen is finalising the plans for the huge jaws of the Rotar Demolition Pulverizer. His challenge is to make something that is incredibly strong, but can be wielded with the precision of a surgeon's scalpel. We have to create a clever machine that can demolish everything that it has to. We have to create to destroy. Once he's completed his computer-aided designs, the plans are sent down to the company's massive factory floor. The job of turning Joris's 2D images into 3D lumps of metal falls to Roman Pilewski. To do that, he flips down his mask and fires up this laser cutter over a slab of heat-treated super-strong steel. Using the remotely controlled cutting head, Roman slices through metal like a knife through butter. In minutes, he's cut out all the parts the company needs to make the jaws of the pulverizer. The next challenge is welding the lumps together, but in this state, the edges are too rough. So they're handed over to Maché. He uses an acetylene torch, heating the steel to burning point. The burning steel reacts with oxygen to form molten iron oxide, which drips off like wax, leaving a smooth edge. Acetylene burns with a really bright light, which was handy when the first cars arrived because the early electric light bulbs weren't bright enough to be used as headlamps, so they used acetylene instead. This is fine until you hit a pothole, because acetylene is explosive. The parts now need to be bent into shape so they can fit together. But bending steel that's this strong takes more than an oversized pair of pliers. It takes this massive mechanical press. Using a foot pedal, Kot Chameshwov applies 200 tonnes of force to each part. The finished parts can now be assembled like a giant model dinosaur. Václav employs a powerful magnet and winch to hoist the sections for the pulverizer's lower jaw into place. Next, he temporarily fixes them together using a technique called tack welding. But to survive the immense stresses of demolishing buildings, the two halves need a tougher weld than this. If you weld cold metal, it could crack under pressure. 
So the jaw is placed in this oven. The door's closed. And it's left to slowly bake for two and a half hours. Once the parts are warm enough, Marcin fully welds the sections together, creating a tough bond that can survive a lifetime of chewing through rubble. But on a demolition site, a tough pair of jaws is useless, unless they can swivel to reach into every corner of an old building. And that's where Robert comes in. He's busy using a robot to weld together something called a subhead the joint between the monster's neck and jaws. This will allow the pulverizer to rotate 360 degrees, bite down and then rip back with 30 tons of force. Can you imagine a T-Rex that can rotate its head through 360 degrees and clamp its jaw down with maximum force in any direction? It's that. The next problem the team have is how to create the holes for the nuts and bolts which will attach the slewing ring. The slewing ring allows the pulverizer head to rotate 360 degrees without changing speed. The solution? Powerful steel bores which can drill holes into the reinforced steel of the body. Next, each part is smoothed off and fine-tuned in a computer-controlled mill. Using Joris's original designs, Valdemar makes sure each nook, cranny and hole is the right size and in the right place. Friction means high temperatures, so a combination of water and oil is used to keep things cool. The parts can now be assembled under the guidance of veteran engineer Jakub Cherokee. He uses a winch to slide the subhead onto a block, holding the lower jaw. Moving jaws this big will take a lot of muscle, and that will be provided by this huge hydraulic cylinder. Once this has been secured, the top jaw is hoisted into position and fixed in place using this massive steel pin. The pulverizer's jaws are now complete. But if you want to chew through a skyscraper for a living, the jaws need a seriously strong set of teeth. These will do nicely. Forged from a custom-made steel alloy, they're three times stronger than normal steel. The trouble is, they'll still need replacing once in a while. So like a transformer's dentures, they're designed to be replaced and secured in seconds using two simple pins. After the jaws have been given a lick of red paint, Fartslav steps in. Like Dr. Frankenstein in Dungarees, it's his job to bring the monster to life. Václav attaches hydraulic hoses to the main piston, waits for a lightning bolt, flicks the switch, and it lives. The finished machine is hoisted onto a waiting truck, ready to be sent off around the world. Mounted on an excavator arm, the Pulvasaurus will soon be doing what it does best. Destroying anything in its path. If you're looking for a classic piece of clothing, you can't beat the flying jacket. Rugged, stylish and manly. And to the airmen of World War II, a lifesaver. The higher you fly, the colder it gets, and cabin temperatures could drop as low as minus 40 degrees. In 1943, high-altitude frostbite accounted for more injuries to bomber crews than all other causes combined. To turn a sheep's skin into a jacket fit for a flying ace, you need to be sharp, skillful, and seriously nimble-fingered. How do they do it? This is the Shot Factory in New York. 
They've been making jackets here for over a century. One of their most famous bits of apparel is the B3 bomber jacket, essential wear for wartime bomber crews. Since World War II, these jackets have been worn by everyone from Steve McQueen to James Dean and Elvis. Today, production is overseen by third-generation company owner and tailor to the stars, Jason Schott. The production methods are virtually the same as they were when this jacket was first created 80 years ago. Like in Grandpappy's day, Jason kicks off the process by inspecting all the skins that come into the factory. They look like normal dyed leather, but they're actually suede, which is the underside of the sheep's skin. Each jacket is made from up to four sheepskins, but no two skins are alike. So Jason has to match ones with similar grains to ensure an even finish. Sheepskin is tough and waterproof on the outside and warm and comfortable on the inside. It also wicks away any moisture from your body. It's hard to find anything that would do the job better, really. The next challenge is slicing the jacket's different sections out of the hides. And that's a job for John Gianfrancesco. I've been kind of sheepskin for shot for 36 years. Sheepskin is expensive. So John needs to arrange the patterns to maximize the amount of material he gets from each hide. It's like a puzzle. You've got to fit them in. John uses a razor blade to slice the skin. The thick fur can play havoc with his straight lines. But John's confident he's got it under control. I know what I'm doing. He presses just enough to slice the leather, but not so much that it tears the wool. So it's going to be like this. Once John has done his bit, the sections of jacket are handed over to the factory's army of expert sewers. With the precision and rhythm of a drummer band, the guys here sew the sections together, swayed side up. After just a few minutes, the jacket starts to take shape. But this stitching leaves an unsightly seam. Not something you want when you're shelling out over $1,000 for a jacket. The answer is strips of goat leather, sliced out by Jason on a kind of 19th century office shredder. Goat skin is soft, flexible and hard-wearing. So it's perfect for sewing over the seams to create a smoother finished look. Goat skin's got another useful property. It's very water resistant. Centuries ago, they used it to carry wine around. Jason's next job is to cut out the belts, which will stop cold air from blowing under the jacket or down your neck. He does this using a kind of oversized cookie cutter which slices out the belt outlines two at a time. The strips have rough edges, so they're passed to Anna for some tidying up. She feeds pellets of solid glue into the top of this machine. The machine then heats the pellets, turning them into a liquid, which Anna uses to seal a fold at the edge of the belt. The folds are then stitched into place before Jason adds protective metal rings to each notch in the belt. The next challenge is sewing the belts on. Two by the neck and two around the waist. The final piece of the puzzle is attaching the zipper. Today, we take these for granted, but Schott was the very first company to add a zipper to a jacket, all the way back in 1925. The zipper we use today was invented in 1913, but didn't get its catchy name for another 10 years when a boot company added them to their boots. They called them zippers for the sound they make when they zip up. Before the finished jacket can be worn by the next generation of Top Guns, there's one final bit of sewing to be done. We're sewing our name into all of these jackets that we're making, and so there's a responsibility to make sure that they stay up to the quality that my great-grandfather would approve of. 
By the time the jacket is complete, it's passed through 20 skilled pairs of hands. Now it can hit the shops, ready to turn ordinary Joes into all-American heroes. I might get a mug here. It's that gorgeous award, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veeley now. This is probably the oldest and weirdest beer in the world. Buffett. Brewed since the 1400s, Lambic beer is sour and tart, unlike anything else you've ever tried. That's because the guys who brew it rely on bacteria and yeasts in the air to start the fermentation. This is basically brewing with all of the modern technology taken out. Since medieval times, knights and monks, peasants and kings have drunk this peculiar beer. And it's made using techniques that have barely changed in centuries. How do they brew it? Brussels, Belgium. They've been making beer in these parts for centuries. Today, at the Contillon Brewery, Jean Van Roy continues the family tradition, using the same methods and equipment as his great-grandfather. Lambic brewing hasn't really changed since the Middle Ages. Back then, they didn't know that it was yeast that turns sugar into alcohol. They thought that the whole process must be a miracle. For some, it was proof that there was a god. I think that I agree. Jean kicks off the process by filling a tank, or mash tun, with a mix of 65% malted barley and 35% unmalted raw wheat. Most brewing mash tuns are sterilised stainless steel barrels. This 150-year-old one, home to millions of bacteria and microbes, is most certainly not. Jean stirs in hot water to dissolve the starches locked up inside the grains of wheat and barley. The water is drawn from a 200-year-old boiling kettle. Once the starch is dissolved, enzymes from the malted barley get to work turning it into sugar. We need a specific temperature to extract a maximum of sugar, but it, it takes a lot of time. We need here between 10 and 11 hours to produce, uh, to, to make a brew. Sugar is critical as it's later broken down by the yeast to form alcohol and carbon dioxide. Different enzymes work at different temperatures, so the sugary liquid, known as wort, is heated in stages from 45 to 72 degrees Celsius. So we pump up the liquid with this old pump into the boiling kettle, and this liquid will come back in the mash tun to warm again all the mash. The repeated mashing lasts until Jean decides the liquid has sweetened enough. Most modern beer makers have automated this process. Super brewer Jean relies on tasting his wort to see when it's ready. That's nice. That's sweet enough. Now it's sweet enough, the wort is pumped into this tank, ready for the next stage of the process. The big mash tun now needs to be cleaned out. And that job falls to this lucky guy. The beery mulch is then loaded up to be used as cattle feed. Somewhere in Belgium, there'll be a party going on in a dairy farm tonight. Jean then rewards the gang with a little sample of the wort. This half-finished beer tastes like a sweet liquid porridge. Mm -mm. Brussels tea. Jean's next job is to add this sack of dried aged hops to the sweetened brew. Twenty-two kilograms go into every ten thousand liters of wort. Brewers have been using hops for centuries. It's what gives beer and lager its natural flavor, and it's also a natural preservative. 
But before hops, they used to throw in stuff like heather and rosemary and bog myrtle to flavor their beer. The hops steep in the hot wort for three hours, releasing aromatic oils and preservative tannins. No time uh, to filter the hop and to pump up the liquid on the cool ship. The cool ship is this massive copper tray in the rafters of the building, exposed to the Brussels air. This is where the yeast comes in. Incredibly, the air we breathe has millions of spores of yeast in it, and Lambic brewers rely on it to ferment their beer. And even more remarkably, it's only the wild yeast found in this part of Belgium that will do. So you can't make Lambic beer anywhere else in the world. Thanks to these wild yeasts, hundreds of flavours have been detected in Lambic beer, including ones that smell exactly like leather, straw, cheese, soap, mould, earth, vinegar, spice, vanilla, caramel, chocolate, butterscotch, honey, sulphur and sweat. There's nothing quite like it. However, the air also contains airborne bacteria, which could infect the beer. So they have to wait for winter to ferment the brew. Only when the temperature drops and the bacteria become inactive is it safe to make lambic beer. Once the wort has been inoculated and allowed to cool, it needs to be stored and aged. But with lambic beer, modern stainless steel kegs won't do. We need contact with the air. The lambic is a, an oxidized beer. Jean's solution is to pour his beer into these ancient oak and chestnut wine barrels, which allow a bit of air in. Most beers ferment in just a few days. Lambic needs up to three years before all the sugars are turned to alcohol. As if it doesn't evaporate away first. We lose a part of the, the liquid because of the natural evaporation, because of the wood absorption. And uh, as in the wine world, we call uh, this uh, losing la part des anges, so the angel share. Once the fermentation is complete, the beer is ready to drink. But some people in Belgium prefer a slightly fruitier taste. Down in the basement, Manu is making a creek, the Belgian name for a cherry-flavoured beer. He takes a barrel that has been fermenting for 18 months and macerates 150 kilograms of cherries in it for at least six weeks. I just took all the beer in my tank, where the cherries are, and um, I will now filter it so I can bottle it. This being Contillon, it's filtered using a machine dating from 1847 that looks like something out of Willy Wonka's factory. I will use my old filter to remove big things. So basically, piece of fruit, skins, seeds, and you see the difference between the two. This is unfiltered, you cannot see through. This one is filtered, see? can see through. Parfait. 